So if keystone species have a huge positive effect on an ecosystem, then nearly the opposite would be invasive species, which have a pretty big negative effect on an ecosystem. So kind of talking about the two ends of the spectrum. So before we talk about examples of invasive species and what exactly they do, uh, let's introduce some key terms that you'll need to keep track of in order to really understand what's happening. So one type of species is a native species. And you actually hear this a lot, especially if you're buying plants, because you'll hear about native plants. These are organisms, so plants and animals, that have always been in that area, at least for as long as scientists and history has recorded. You know, this bird has always been found in Maryland. It is native to Maryland. So that's one type of species. The second type, so there's really only two types, uh, native and non-natives. Sometimes non-natives are also referred to as introduced species. So this is a species that has been taken from one area and introduced to a new area by humans. Sometimes this is done on purpose, and we'll talk about some examples of those, and sometimes it's done on accident. You've had an organism that kind of hitched a ride some way or another and got introduced to a new area. So those are the two main types, native and non-native. But this whole section is about invasive species, so where does that fit in? So invasive species are non-native species. However, what makes a non-native invasive is this that organism is causing harm to another species, to a group of species, or to the entire ecosystem. So all invasive species are going to be non-native. However, not all non-native or not all introduced species are invasive. Some organisms are introduced to an area, but they don't really have an effect on the ecosystem. They're not hurting other organisms. They're not hurting the ecosystem. So therefore, they're not considered invasive. For example, one example of an introduced species is the honeybee. We introduced them centuries ago in order to help pollinate our crops, uh, particularly in the days when everywhere in the United States was doing agriculture. But they're not invasive. They don't, because we have so many plants that need pollinated, they're really not taking away from the native species of bees. So they're not hurting the ecosystem. So it's an example of a non-native, but it's not invasive. If you look about the 7,000 non-native species that exist in the United States, only a seventh or about a thousand of them are even considered invasive. So that's something to really keep in mind. Just because they're non-native does not make them invasive. But how, how do they make that jump, right? How, how does a non-native species become invasive? Or what characteristics of invasive species make them invasive? So one of them has to do with enemies. One way to control populations is literally by eating them. But these organisms, these invasive organisms, maybe they don't have a natural enemy. <clears throat> so a natural enemy can be a couple things. One, it can be a direct predator. It can also be a competitor. So if thinking about those bees, uh, if they don't have any other bees they're competing with, that means they get that food source all to themselves. It could also be related to diseases and parasites. You know, this fish has moved from one area to another, and in that new area, there's actually no disease that kills it. It's, it's immune to them. So they just don't really have ways they're dying. Usually, uh, a non-native species that becomes invasive is because they can reproduce incredibly fast. And um, we'll talk about a couple of examples of this. Maybe it's plants that grow fast. Maybe it's fish that lay millions of eggs. Maybe it's rabbits that are reproducing multiple times in a season. They could also be generalist species. So remember back with food chains, we talked about specialists that only eat maybe a couple of things. And we have generalists, things that eat a lot of things. Well, if you're an invasive species, if you eat a lot of things, that means you can make a huge impact into the ecosystem. Another thing is that these organisms might be pioneer species. So the same way we use pioneers for humans, pioneers someone that goes into a new area. Well, same thing with species. Some species are great in new ecosystems. That means if they're the first ones there, they can reproduce and populate and have no competitors and have a food source to themselves. 
So an invasive species may or may not have all of these qualities. They might have a couple that help them out. They might have all of them. But if they don't have any of these, then more than likely they're not going to be invasive. They're not going to negatively impact their ecosystem. And then finally, a lot of these species might be long-lived, which might make that high reproductive rate even worse. So let's talk about some examples that we can find here locally in Mar Maryland. One of them is the brown marmorated stink bug. On the tests and stuff, you're really just going to see me use the word stink bug, but I wanted to show you the full name because here in Maryland, we actually have quite a few different stink bug species. The way you know that it is the invasive stink bug is if you look at the antenna, you can see in this picture there's these white bands. That is the invasive stink bug. If you see them, you should kill them. However, kill them in an open area because when you kill them, they release this chemical that stinks, hence the name stink bug. Uh, so that's also another thing. Stink bugs themselves don't stink. It's just when you kill them, that's when they release their smell. This is actually fairly new to the area. It was introduced in the 90s, made its way down to Maryland in the 2000s, uh, and that's kind of where uh, they've exploded. One of the reasons they've exploded is they don't really have natural predators, and being an insect, uh, they're also reproducing a lot. But how did they get here in the first place? You know, no one probably wanted to bring them over on purpose, right? Why do you want more stink bugs? So it was an accident. So they were introduced by humans, accidentally. What we think happened, we don't know for sure, but we think that they came over in some crates from Asia. So they are found naturally in Asia. We think that in some shipping crates that came over on a barge or whatnot, that maybe some of their eggs were there or some of the insects were around, and they first landed kind of in the Pennsylvania area. And from there, their populations just went wild. There was really nothing limiting their populations. Now for us, like you and me in our homes, yeah, having stink bugs is kind of gross and you don't want them in your home, but that's not that bad of a downside. However, they are huge pests in agriculture fields, especially in this area. So on this map, uh, in red or orange, is having severe agriculture issues. So that's not so great. And here, Maryland's like right in the middle of all of it. So not only do we have it on our homes, but our farmers are suffering uh, because of these stink bug infestations. Yes, we can use pesticides, but there's downsides to pesticides. Uh, so you have quite a few issues. They have been found in other states, uh, some of them also affecting agriculture, some of them just a nuisance, so people see them and they bother them, but uh, oh well. Uh, in green, they've just seen them, but they don't have any huge outbreaks. But as you can see, it started in one state. It started in Pennsylvania, and it exploded in their population and can have a really negative effect. Another local invasive to Maryland is the snakehead, which is a huge fish that you guys can catch in most rivers in Maryland. And I really emphasize huge fish because when it comes to freshwater ecosystems uh, here in Maryland, you don't really have that many fish that reach 20 pounds. Snakeheads have got it though. And because snakeheads get so high, they've got two things going for them. One, there is very few things that eat them. Uh, and two, they also eat pretty much anything and everything. So because nothing really eats them and they eat everything, they essentially serve as a top predator in their ecosystem with no way of stopping them. <clears throat> Paired with the fact that they lay millions of eggs every year. So not really that great. Uh, and, and they're spreading. Uh, just with most invasive species, they're always spreading. So how they get over here? Humans have brought snakeheads over on purpose, but they got released into the wild accidentally. So it's kind of like this both, like kind of accidentally released, but we did bring them over. So the reason they've been brought over on purpose is in a lot of Southeast Asia countries, snakehead is a really popular fish and it's a really tasty fish. So a lot of Asian markets uh, were bringing over snakeheads into you know, aquariums into supermarkets in order to sell it to the people who wanted something familiar. Well, 
We don't exactly know what happened, but we're pretty sure that one of these Asian markets, maybe they had some old fish that weren't selling, or maybe a tank broke and they got released, but we're pretty sure that it was these aquarium fish that got released into the ecosystem, and because they grow so quick, and because they don't eat any, or they eat everything, and because nothing eats it, they just exploded and have been branching out. Now, it's more of an Asian delicacy. So although a lot of people in the United States can catch them, they don't know how to prepare them because they are prepared a little bit differently. So although we can say, well, why don't we just fish more of them? We can, and we're trying to, but there's not a lot of restaurants that serve it because it's really considered a delicacy. But there are some. So if you guys are ever interested in D.C., uh, there's a couple of restaurants. Uh, there's a Laos restaurant, L-A-O-S restaurant, uh, that serves snakehead. And actually, in my opinion, it tastes pretty good. Uh, so it was released on accident, but it was brought over to the United States originally on purpose. And that's kind of that key point there. So I want you guys to go ahead and pause here. There's going to be a video popping up in just a moment that is looking at the snakehead. There's another fact about them that is so crazily fascinating that actually helps them in being an invasive species that this video talks about. So pause here, watch this video, and come back when you're done. Another invasive species is not found here in Maryland, but I wanted to bring it up. It is found in the United States in Hawaii, but it was a species brought over for a purpose, and that purpose was to serve as a biological control. A biological control is a natural or biological way of typically controlling something, and that something is usually a pest. So for example, in Hawaii, Hawaii originally didn't have any rats. Rats were introduced by colonists, and more than likely those rats were on their boats, and as they landed and brought things on shore, uh, the rats inadvertently were brought over as well. Now, rats will eat everything, but on Hawaii, they had a really huge issue with their sugar cane plantations. The rats were getting into the sugar cane and really decimating their crops. So farmers could have used rat poison, but they didn't want to introduce that poison into the ecosystem. So instead, they thought, you know what, why don't I bring over a predator that will eat the rats? And that's exactly what they did. They brought over this guy. This is a mongoose. It's in the weasel family and mongoose in some of their areas eat rats. So these farmers were like, hey, let's bring over mongoose. Mongoose eat the rats. Yeah, um, that didn't happen. So apparently mongoose eat during the day and rats only come out at night. So mongooses don't even see rats at all. Uh, so the mongoose just started eating other things during the day, such as birds and bird eggs and different reptiles. Since introducing the mongoose on the Hawaiian islands, they have like had like five extinctions of birds um, across all the Hawaiian islands and locally even like 10 or plus uh, local extinction of birds because the mongoose are eating them all. So here's an example where we purposely brought over an organism to do a job that it didn't do and it's because we didn't think it out. Fortunately, this type of problem is becoming less and less. There's actually tons of famous stories of biological controls gone wrong. The idea is great though, right? Like, hey, we're not going to use chemicals. We're not going to, you know, introduce a toxin into the community. Instead, let's use an animal to do it. And the animal went out of control. And we'll talk about a couple of stories of that. Now, animals aren't the only things that can be invasive. Actually, most of the invasive species we have here in the United States are actually plants. And one famous plant that you can find even here uh, in Germantown, in the D.C. area, is kudzu. And the nickname of kudzu is the vine that ate the South, just to give you an idea uh, of the proportions of this vine. In some areas, this vine grows up to a foot a day. Now that's kind of on the rarer side. Um, don't be like, oh my god, there's kudzu, it's going to eat me overnight. That's not the case. Uh, but if the conditions are right, you got the nutrients, got the water, got the sunshine, got everything, it can grow up to a foot a day, which is pretty impressive. So kudzu has a very interesting story. So it was originally brought over in the late 1800s as an ornamental plant. People would put it in their yards, grow it on their houses, looks really cool. 
<coughs> and at this time, it was just non-native. It wasn't invasive. It wasn't growing out of control because people had them in their gardens. They were keeping it under control. The issue came during the Dust Bowl. So during the Dust Bowl, we were faced with a lot of droughts and we're having a lot of soil erosion. Because kudzu grew so quickly, farmers and governments were growing kudzu on purpose. You know, the corn wasn't growing because the soil was such in bad shape, so farmers would grow kudzu over their fields. You know, areas that had other erosion problems, the government was growing them, especially along railroad tracks, was growing kudzu. And it worked amazing. This was actually a really great success story, and one of the reasons why we came out of the Dust Bowl, because this kudzu really was holding the soil down and was really building that soil back up. However, not all farmers returned to their land. You know, some of these railroads were abandoned, and therefore, no one was managing the kudzu. So the kudzu did what it did best. It grew, and grew, and grew. And now you have, like, structures that are literally overgrown. If you drive on Interstate, especially 95, you can see it on 495 as well, but really 95, in Germantown, like at the end of Middlebrook Road, you'll find it. In Bethesda, where I live, like there's, it's everywhere. If you look at the trees, if they seem incredibly leafy, like including the trunk, it's not the tree. It's kudzu. It's kudzu growing over the tree. And this is where kudzu becomes an issue for the ecosystem and why it's now considered an invasive species. Kudzu will grow over all sorts of things. Buildings, cars, houses and other plants. And when it covers other plants, it's taking sunlight from those other plants. Uh, it has the potential to take water and nutrients from those other plants. And slowly, the organisms that it's growing over start dying. And there's not a lot of species here in the United States that even eat kudzu. So not only are you killing those producers that it's climbing over, but you're also killing a huge food source for the organisms that live in that ecosystem and it's really hard to get rid of not only does nothing really eat it there's not that many ways to actually combat it on a pesticide level on you know a fire or pooling level however i do want you to pause here and watch this video it's actually this teenager that came up with a really cool way to kill kudzu and it's interesting the way he does it and what i want you guys to think about and one of your weekly guide questions is how is the way that he's killing kudzu superior to other ways of killing kudzu? And how we can kind of use this knowledge to combat invasive species in the future. So go ahead and pause here, watch this video on this YouTube link, and then come back here for the rest of the lecture.